curriculum intent can be summarized in one sentence, which is that we seek to empower all of our students to be independent, critical and literate members of society. Uh, but you'll notice in our curriculum intent, we then have a series of criteria and things that we think need to be achieved uh, to demonstrate we've, we've met that overarching aim. Um, that includes making sure that all of our students are confident and competent, independent readers and writers of texts. Um, uh, we also make sure our students, as far as we can in English, are prepared for their next steps. Um, for some students, that will be to take further study in the subject. For others, it's just access to whatever that next step may be. Uh, and we also uh, aim to help all of our students get the grades that they aspire to. Uh, and that obviously will vary from student to student. I think it really comes from our curriculum intent. So we, we went back and looked at our offer at Key Stage 3 and 4 uh, in light of that intent, but also in light of what we discovered from our Key Stage 2 transition work and also from uh, the requirements of Key Stage 5. Um, we started with a skills-based approach and that came from this idea of independent, critical readers and writers. Um, so every scheme that we teach is thematic, um, but the, uh, the thread that goes through all of them uh, is that skills-based approach. Um, and then when we were deciding what our theme should be, particularly in years seven to nine in the build-up to the GCSE study, um, we started to debate what we thought was the, the powerful knowledge that students needed. Um, and that's based on the research of Michael Young. Um, and we did that as an English leadership team. Uh, and then we broadened that out to the department for a discussion as well, because uh, we're, we're aware that we shouldn't be the gatekeepers of cultural capital. Um, uh, and we use that definition of Pierre Bourdieu for cultural capital, so the idea of access to social situations and culture. To, to empower people. Uh, and as a result, <clears throat> each of our schemes is thematic. It covers the breadth of issues. You know, we're particularly proud of our um, prejudice and discrimination scheme of work. We're proud of our role of religion scheme of work, uh, amongst others. Uh, and each of those uh, thematic schemes then refer back to each other. And there's a lot of interleaving of knowledge as well as skills, uh, which prepare students both for, for GCSE, but also beyond. The schemes themselves, we're obviously taking students from their starting point and we're trying to make them better readers and writers. So there's a very qualitative element to that. They can see the progress from, from lesson to lesson and scheme to scheme. Um, we also have isolated uh, instances and moments where we can see that. So spoken language at, at GCSE, we do prepare our students for that through debate, through discussion, which uh, allows people to have a voice. Um, and some students kind of say to us in the lesson or end of those periods, um, you know, we didn't think we were taught like that or we hadn't thought in that way before, uh, which for us is success. Um, but one of the things we're kind of proudest of is a, a letter writing piece of work we do in the middle of year nine, where students research uh, someone that they might be inspired by, whether it's for careers or future. They write a letter to them, they handwrite the letter, modelling all of the skills they've learnt, and they send the letter to that recipient. And the idea of the, the project is they then get a response back and we've had some phenomenal responses. We've had uh, goodie bags from influencers. We've had letters from football clubs. Uh, we've had scientists getting in touch. And that has a real world application for our students. So it's empowering them to make that connection and see how English has helped them have that, that influence in the wider world. Part of that's our quality assurance process. So, um, you know, as an English leadership team with uh, currently three post holders, um, we have a timetable where we walk through every uh, every year group at least twice a fortnight. Uh, and those walkthroughs are supportive, obviously, um, but it's also a chance for us to check um, students in terms of the content that's being covered with the skills. Um, we're checking for quantity of work, the quality of the feedback, uh, and that really raises for us any any issues that may occur. Um, in terms of students having that content delivered. Alongside that, regular department meetings have teaching and learning uh, slots, but we also um, discuss and moderate and standardise both schemes and tests to make sure the students are happy uh, and learning. And we have a constant process of review. So um, every term uh, we get staff to discuss what went well and what could be improved or refined with our schemes. Uh, so the curriculum review for Key Stage 3 recently was actually a revamping of something we've actually been doing for the last five or six years. So it wasn't a real step change for us there and we also encourage student voice so we noticed a couple of years ago now students weren't making enough progress in persuasive writing so we wrote an intervention piece of work for students we implemented that through the staff through training and they delivered it but then we took student voice at the end so we didn't just have data we also had students telling us did they feel as though they were making progress and did they find it challenging 
and that obviously allows us to reflect on what we're offering uh, as well. So, um, the first thing, the vocabulary then, um, we, what we did, we recognised that tier two and tier three vocabulary should be much more explicitly taught to students and I'm passionate about that being across the school, not just in English. Um, so the first step was to lean on the expertise of some of our colleagues who've been in other schools who've seen it work. Um, so both Emma and Tanith were at a previous school, they, they did some good work there. So they brought that to us. We devised the vocabulary initially for Key Stage 4 uh, that we thought should be explicitly taught. We shared that with staff and modelled that with them and we, uh, we asked staff to act, actually uh, explicitly teach that vocabulary and then reward students for using it uh, and make students aware of that so they were highlighting where they're using the vocabulary uh, and really clearly in this year's year 11 cohort we can see in their exam style answers you know students aiming for grade four are using words such as archetypal capitalist uh, which is you know really sophisticated so that was successful uh, our next step was to put it into key stage three so we've Basically, we've tweaked each of our scheme of work grids, so there's clear vocabulary in there for staff to, to make sure they're using, and we'll obviously monitor that through the quality assurance. Um, and we're also, at the moment, creating knowledge organisers for staff for, for GCSE, um, aiming for the highest grades possible. Uh, and the point of those is, in there, we'll have tier two and tier three vocab that every single staff member can then teach to their children, no matter what the set. The, the tricky area between the marking and the actual response, what do you do in the middle? Um, so that, that's an ongoing area for us. I think it's an area where there's a lot of value that can be gained for all of our students in terms of progress. Um, so the first thing is we raised it as an issue with the team when we discussed uh, the practical implications. You know, if you've got a class of 30 students and six targets, how do you respond to that? Um, and we've tried a variety of approaches. So one approach is that uh, we've set six different tasks on different slides and direct students to those. Uh, and that's had some success. Um, we've also considered planning subsequent lessons to deal with those targets um, and also offering more exemplars that are tailored to that feedback over time. Um, so certainly it's, it's conscious, um, staff are definitely experimenting. We haven't hit upon one approach that solves the problem and, and if we did I think we'd have solved education. So uh, we'll continue to experiment and, and iterate but I, I think there's definite progress there. Uh, yeah, so I think it's important not to be tokenistic uh, with that. Uh, you know saying this is your career's lesson in English, I think will restrict it. So uh, signaling uh, ways that these things can be implemented in, in the real world, whether that's for specific careers or that can be used in a variety of careers. So uh, for us in, in English, we're, we're fortunate that half of our language GCSE is about persuasive writing and reading. Uh, and I think all of us understand that we're selling ourselves, we're selling our careers, we're selling our jobs. Uh, we need to write persuasive applications, we need to convince people of viewpoints. And just making that explicit is, is really helpful. Um, but alongside that, we've also got the letter writing scheme that we talked about uh, previously, which enables students to see the impact of their writing. Uh, we have had author visits and we, we hope to continue those post COVID. Uh, and those visits uh, are powerful in showing children that it's possible uh, to become published and to actually have a valid career in writing. Um, so, so there are opportunities in that way, but it's actually about making it more conscious and broader for our students. And that's something we've been working on. I think that's definitely the biggest area for us to work on and I'll be honest with that and I think our team would say that as well. Um, you know, we definitely are promoting independence. Um, you know, the way that we've designed our year eight and year nine and year 10 approach to assessment, um, you know, we've created an end of year test for year eight where they have to revise a Christmas carol and we're explicitly teaching those strategies and expecting students to revise. In year nine, we give them less support with that. Um, we say here are some poems that are going to be assessed at the end of the year. We'll teach some of the poems, but then we're going to give you the, the homework and the independence to, to learn the remaining poems. And that then gets applied at the end of the year. And then in year 10, they have 15 poems. So they're, they're building up over time. We do have an independent reading challenge, uh, which has been very successful. And we've run that with every year group from year seven through to 11, um, where we ask students, we make it very clear, this is above and beyond what you're doing in class. Uh, we want you to challenge yourself to read more than you currently do. Um, you're going to set the challenge and you're going to share that with your class teacher and with a parent or guardian. Uh, and once they complete the challenge, they're rewarded with a little independent reading badge, which they really, really like. And, and they have that on their blazer and it's been quite successful. Uh, and we have absolutely created independent readers as a result of that. So uh, that's another example of how we've built it in uh, above and beyond our curriculum as well.
Absolutely. So in a nutshell, strengths of our curriculum, we have a really clear pedagogy. Um, I think every member of staff can say example, Anna, take him a take team. Uh, and the curriculum design is really powerful. Um, you know, I think it's some of the best of and certainly the county, if not the broader. So their strengths, key areas for development. Um, one is making character more explicit for our students. Uh, and the second is that feedback. I think they're the two areas for us to work on.